One of the challenges we face today with stateful applications in Kubernetes is storage. And there have been lots of solutions that try to solve this problem. The problem is that when you spin up a pod, the storage attached to that pod may or may not be there. And while there have been many solutions to try to tackle this problem, I think I found one that's pretty robust. Hey, welcome back. So I'm Techno Tim, and today we're going to talk about setting up storage in Kubernetes. But before we get started, a huge thank you again to all of you. This has been an incredible year for my channel, and I can't thank you enough. And another thing before we get started, thanks ahead of time for the likes and comments because it lets me know if I'm on track. And if you run into any problems along the way, be sure to check out my live stream on Twitch. I spend a lot of time there answering your questions. So if you have a question about anything in this video, hop in and let's figure it out. And so let's get into it. So storage in Kubernetes is hard and complicated. In most clusters, you're running more than one node. So bind mounting is never a good choice because you can't guarantee that that volume is going to be there when a pod spins up. And a persistent volume claim is typically the way to go. But when you configure your persistent volume, again, it's never guaranteed that when you mount that volume, that pod can communicate with it. Because what if that pod's in another cluster? Or what happens if that mount gets dismounted? And ideally, we'd like Kubernetes nodes that have block storage attached to them that can spin up anywhere in your cluster, replicate that data, and make it available to all of your pods. And since we're building our wish list for storage, how about snapshots and backups? And with all of these wishes or requirements, I started looking for storage. And that's when I settled on Longhorn. Longhorn is a lightweight, reliable, and easy way to get block storage within Kubernetes. It allows us to use disks on the node for storage. We can even use some leftover space from our existing nodes and partition that if we like. And it can replicate this across all nodes that you dedicate to storage, making it highly available within your cluster. And they've also made it really easy to install, configure, and manage. Now, this is a product by Rancher, but let me be clear that this can be installed without using Rancher. It can be installed using Kube Control, Helm, or from the Rancher app catalog. So while I'm going to show you how to do this within Rancher, it doesn't require Rancher to install this. And so let's get into it. So the first thing you're going to need, obviously, is a Kubernetes cluster. You should be able to run something like Kube Control get nodes and see your existing nodes. If you need help setting that up, I've got a complete guide on how to install K3S and then install Rancher on top of that, if you like. Because again, Rancher is not a requirement for this. But you should be able to run Coop Control get nodes and see some nodes. And if you are running Rancher, you should be able to see the nodes in your cluster. And you can see my cluster here is a six node cluster. Now I have two dedicated to the Kubernetes API or control plane, and then four dedicated to user workloads or agents. And Longhorn can be set up a couple of ways. First, you can create more nodes and dedicate those nodes just to storage. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Or you can use your existing nodes and reclaim some of the space left over on those nodes. Now that seems like a good option, but I think we've all run into disk pressure issues before in the past. So I'm going to spin up four more nodes that are just dedicated to storage. But feel free to use your existing nodes if you like. And if you chose to spin up more nodes, you should be able to run Coop Control get nodes and see those new nodes. The new nodes that I'm dedicating to storage start with Luna. And you can see them here too in the Rancher UI. Now I didn't apply any taints and we'll apply some later, but for now, they're just nodes that can take on additional workloads. Next, we'll create a new project for our storage. Now a project's just a way to group things together, but we should be able to go to project slash namespaces, add a project, and we'll call this storage. Then we should see our new storage project and let's navigate to it. And now we can install Longhorn from the Rancher app store. And if you decide to do this without Rancher, I'll have instructions that you can find in the description below. But within Rancher, we'll go to apps and we'll launch a new app. From here, we wanna search for Longhorn and then click on Longhorn. Here, you can see a lot of options. All of these we're gonna keep on the defaults, but there are a couple you'll wanna pay attention to. First, you wanna make sure that this is the default storage class. That's so when we create new pods and we give them storage, the default storage class will be Longhorn. The other option you'll wanna pay attention to is whether or not we wanna expose this to our load balancer. Now, I'm gonna say false here and we'll still be able to get to the UI, but if you wanted to expose this, on your load balancer, 
you would click true here, but I don't recommend doing that. And so we should be able to click launch here. And now Longhorn is spinning up. And if we go into Longhorn, we can see it's spinning up different pods, services, and some config maps as well. Now you won't have to touch any of this. This is just kind of where I monitor the installation progress. And eventually this should turn green. And we can also check to see if it's deployed if we run coop control N, which is our namespace, Longhorn dash system, and then get the service. If we run that, we should see that everything's up and running. So let's go back and check out the UI. So after clicking on index, we can see we have a UI to manage our storage. We can see here that we don't have any volumes yet, that we have a total of 244 gigs across all of our nodes to use, and then we have seven nodes and they're all schedulable right now. And this may differ depending on how many nodes you have and how much storage they have. But the important part is, is that right now we actually have Longhorn installed and configured. And you could actually use it as is, but we're gonna configure a few things. So if we go into nodes, we can see all of our nodes right now. And so all of the Haley nodes right now are just general workload nodes. And then all of my Luna ones will be dedicated to storage. But right now, all of them can take on the role of a storage node but we'll fix that later. And here we can edit some of our nodes. So we can see that this node right here, we can add some tags if we want, but we can see where the path of the storage is mounted. And that's in slash var slash lib slash longhorn. So on all of these nodes, the volumes will be mounted here. And so what I like to do is edit my nodes and I'll add some tags. And these tags really aren't important, but it's a way for me to understand the type of machine as well as the type of disk. And so for my storage node, I gave it a node tag of storage and fast. That's because this is going to be a dedicated storage node and it's a faster node. And for disk tags, I just gave this one a tag of SSD because this is running on solid state storage. And then one other call out really quick is you could actually mount a disk to these nodes if you wanted. You could add a disk add a mount path, and then save it here, which now you can see how customizable this is. You can mount a path from anywhere within your network on these nodes. And so you have a lot of flexibility here, but I'm not gonna add that and I'll just save my tags. And I'll do the same thing for the rest. Really not important, but I like to do it. Okay, that's all we'll do in nodes for now, but we can move on to volumes. And in volumes, we don't see anything here yet, and that's to be expected. This will populate as we create persistent volume claims, and this will be totally automatic. So we'll skip over this for now. And backups, if you navigate there, you'll get an error. That's because we haven't configured a backup location yet, which is in settings. And so let's go into general settings, and in here, we'll only change a couple of things. Now, you can get by without changing any of this, but I'm gonna show you how to configure backups as well as apply a taint, but we'll talk about taint here in a second. But for backups, you can have one or two targets. And backups in general are just a way to get that data outside of the cluster so that if you lose all of your storage nodes, you can restore them from backup and it's not located within your Kubernetes cluster. So you have two options here. The first one is Use S3. So this is compatible with S3 storage, which is Amazon's simple storage service. And you can configure an S3 endpoint here if you like. And if you wanted to configure S3, it would look like this. So you would use the S3 protocol, then you would supply your bucket name, and then you would supply your AWS region. Then the only thing you would need to configure after that is your secret for that account. And so that secret would be configured here in resources, and you would create a secret. So we could add a secret, we could call it AWS secret, then it will be a couple of key value pairs with your secret. And in here, the secret key would be AWS access key ID along with your secret, and then AWS secret access key along with your access key secret or the value. And you would say that, and then have that secret in Kubernetes, and then just reference that secret in the backup target credential secret. And so what that will do is pull that secret out of Kubernetes, use that when backing up, and back up to an S3 bucket. And if you don't have S3, you have some other options. You could spin up MinIO or MinIO or MinIO, and that will give you an S3 compatible API to store these objects wherever you want, not necessarily AWS. And this is an open source project that gives you the same API that you get in S3 but locally on-prem or in the cloud or wherever. And I've also noticed that TrueNAS supports this out of the box too, which is pretty cool. And so if you didn't want to use AWS S3, you can use Minio or MinIO and spin that up in your own infrastructure locally. But if you didn't want to do either of that, you can use NFS too. And if you wanted to use NFS instead, it would look like this. So it would be NFS protocol, 
and then the IP address of your NFS endpoint, and then a path on that server to the storage location. And so here you can see my NFS endpoint is 192.168.60.14, and the path on disk is slash mount slash storage zero slash NFS underscore Longhorn. I've decided to go with NFS because it works better in my infrastructure. And also I'd love to get MinIO working in my own infrastructure, but I noticed there's some problems with certificates. But in the future, I'd love to switch to MinIO because lots of things use S3 storage but NFS will work for now. And you don't need this secret here either because NFS doesn't support secrets. Okay, so we have our backups configured, now on to taints. I know I said we'd talk about taints, but these don't work the way you'd think they would. Now I've tried many combinations of taints and tolerations to ensure that these nodes are dedicated to storage, but it seemed like every combination I tried didn't work the way I wanted it to. And so we won't apply one here, although I think this feature does work. I don't think it's as intuitive as it should be, but we'll save it without a taint here, and then we'll take care of this within nodes. So within nodes, the easiest way to do this is just disable our existing general workload nodes from taking on storage jobs. And that's as simple as editing this node and then choosing disable. And that's all we need to do to make sure that our general workload nodes don't take on these storage jobs. And maybe there's a better way to do this. If you know, let me know in the comments section below. And so we've done all of that now, but we haven't actually taken advantage of storage. So let's do that really quick. So let's spin up a workload that takes advantage of a persistent volume claim that's backed by Longhorn. So we'll go into our cluster, but instead of just deploying a generic workload, let's go into the Rancher App Store. Let's choose apps, and then let's launch an app. So within here, you can see many different apps, but let's choose a WordPress blog. So I know you're familiar with WordPress, and the reason why I'm choosing this is because it actually requests a persistent volume claim. It needs to persist data to disk for both the database and the web server or your content. And I get it, you can use an external database, but at the end of the day, the web server still needs to write some of the content to disk. And so let's launch this. And so in here, we're just gonna fill up a few different things. I'm gonna set a password. And here, we're gonna set the persistent volume enable to true. And here it says, use the default class, which should be Longhorn, but I'm gonna choose it anyways. And you see now we have Longhorn as a persistent volume. And so let's choose that. Here, I don't think that my WordPress needs to take up 10 gig. I'm just gonna say one gig. And for MariaDB, we can choose whether or not to install it. I'll say true for the sake of this demo. And we'll set a MariaDB password. Side note, I hear some people say MariaDB versus Maria. Is it Maria or Mariah? Let me know in the comments section below. And then we'll set our password here. And here again, we want to choose a persistent volume, and then we can set the class to Longhorn. And our default one is Longhorn, but I'm just choosing it just to be sure. So now we can set the size that our MariaDB container is going to request from our volume claim. And so they have eight gigs, I'll keep it at eight gigs. And then we should be able to just click launch. So now it's going to spin that up, but let's take a look inside of Longhorn while this is happening. So if we go into Longhorn, we immediately see we have two replicas. We see replicas, so our data is replicating. And if we go into volumes, we can see right now it's creating volumes and attaching them to those pods. And so we can drill into this volume and we can see that this is spun up and replicated across three of our nodes. So Luna 01, Luna 03, and Luna 02 all have a copy of this data because it's replicated across the nodes. And you can see here it's running. And if we scroll into here, we can see that this is the WordPress claim. So this is the content. So let's go back really quick, go into this other claim, and we can see here that this is the WordPress MariaDB claim. And that's replicated across three nodes. Really cool. So let's check out our WordPress blog. So if we go out to our WordPress blog, here it is. And we can log in here using the account we created. And after signing in, there are tons of updates. And I have to resist not clicking on updates, but this is a demo. Okay, let's go for it. Oh no, no. And so we can create a post. And so we'll create a post really quick. And a reminder, don't forget to like and sub if you haven't already. And let's publish this post. And we can view our post, and here it is. And so those changes are now written to disk in those persistent volume claims. So let's go back. And so now we've written that to disk and that is replicated across nodes. Now we should be able to take down the pod that's running WordPress to MariaDB, have it spin up on another pod and attach to those volumes. 
and we should still have our post. So it looks like these workloads are running on Hele O1 and Luna O2. So let's evict those pods so that they run somewhere else and see if they reattach to our storage. So Hele O1, I'm going to drain or cordon and the same thing with Luna O2. And so now that these are draining, those pods should be scheduled somewhere else. So let's go check. So if we go back into WordPress, we should see that these are getting rescheduled. And now if we check, we can see that this is scheduled on Luna 01 and Luna 03. So let's see if our content is still there. So if we refresh our WordPress blog, we can see here that we still have our content. And so this same thing applies if we were to take down an entire storage node or two. Now these pods can attach to this claim, which is storage floating around within our Kubernetes node and use the storage from any of those nodes. And when we go back into volumes, you can see that this one was detached because that node went away, but then it reattached to another node. So that's really awesome. And in here, we can actually take snapshots if we want. So let's talk about backups. So if you want to take backups within the cluster, you would take snapshots. And that's as simple as clicking on a snapshot right here. And you can manually take a snapshot. We can take a snapshot and there we are. And so this is a great way to take really quick snapshots within the cluster. And so you can kick off a couple, take another snapshot. There we go, we have another snapshot. And those snapshots will be replicated within the cluster. But then we also have the option to create a backup. And that's why we set up our NFS location or S3 if you use S3. It's to take a backup or create a snapshot and export it outside of this cluster for disaster recovery or for spinning up a new cluster and attaching to that. And that's as simple as clicking create backup. And you can add labels to your backup if you like, but I'm just gonna hit okay. And now you can see it's creating this backup and this seems to be asynchronous. So it just fires off and forgets. And here we go, now we have a backup. And this is stored outside of our cluster, which is really awesome. And you can take more snapshots if you like, more snapshots, create a backup, and there we go. And if we go into backups, now we can see that we have these backups available to us. And so we could totally destroy this cluster, spin up a new cluster, set up Longhorn, and restore this backup to that cluster if we like. Or if you have multiple clusters with failover clusters, you could keep these backups available to both clusters and attach it to the new cluster if one goes down, which is this option to create a DR volume. So you can create a DR volume and you can even create backup jobs if you like. So we can schedule backup jobs or snapshots. So let's create a new snapshot. Let's go with every minute and save. And then we can create a new backup job if we like, a new backup, say every minute and save. And we can do that same thing with other volumes too. Backup every minute and we'll do a snapshot every minute. And you can set retention if you like too. So you can save the last 20, 10, 100, whatever you like. And if you schedule them, they'll start populating. So I hope this shows you how easy Longhorn can be. Longhorn is an easy and efficient way to create block storage that replicates throughout your Kubernetes cluster. And there are alternatives out there, but I found this to be the most easy and reliable way to do this. It takes very little config and they created a great UI to manage this. And so I think this is going to be my Kubernetes block storage solution moving forward. And so what do you think about Longhorn? What do you think about storage within Kubernetes? Have you tried some alternatives out there? If so, let me know in the comments section below. While you're down there, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. And if you have more questions, you can always join my live stream. I stream every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you have a question about this video or any of my videos, hop in my stream and let's figure it out. So thanks so much for watching and till next time, stream on my friends. Don't think because, hey, you know, Tim, you know, so far, you know, I've been doing Docker installs of Rancher and now Tim releases this Rancher HA video. Now I got to redo everything. You don't have to, absolutely you don't have to. Cause, cause at the end of the day, um, you're using Rancher. I mean, um, the capability you're getting from it isn't, isn't to, to run Rancher, right? It's to run all the services that you have running within Kubernetes and somehow getting all of those to work with all of your infrastructure at home. And so, you know, Rancher is just an enabler, right? And so think of it like an enabler. Rancher is an enabler to enable Kubernetes and even Kubernetes is an enabler to enable services to run. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if you have those services running at home, yeah, there's, there's no need ever to redo your infrastructure unless, unless that's what you're passionate about, unless that's what you want to do. And you're like, 
yeah, yeah, I'm, I've been waiting for this. Let's let's do this, you know. And so.